Hello, Peter. Hello, Sam. I've been following you on Twitter for a while, and I find you to be very interesting. Um, I see. I'm, I'm just, because I, I, your Twitter account, I think it's quite enigmatic. And I couldn't work out whether it was a character or whether that's actually who you are. And I don't mean that in an offensive way. I mean that because I, I enjoy your Twitter, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I know it sounds a bit offensive, but that's, that's how I <laughs> discovered it. And I was like, that's what, why, what my initial message to you was. I was like, is this like <laughs> deliberately comedic or is this just who you are as a person? Uh, there's a compliment in there somewhere if we dig uh, far enough. Uh, <laughs> like everybody, I'm an amalgam. <clears throat> I'm, you know, the, the person, you, we're all different when we're on our own behind closed doors and we're all different in public, let's say. And Twitter is very much, you're in public. So... Uh, it's a combination of things, really, uh, but mainly my character. Otherwise, I could I couldn't do it wholeheartedly and in earnest if it weren't really uh, my character. So it is my character. It's whether you magnify parts of it, or so that's really uh, how I am on there. And what I love about it is, and from other people's accounts as well, you they can just be yourself. You can say what you're having for dinner, whether that's interesting or not, is immaterial. The beauty of it is you could do type one dot an hour on there and they'd get 10 replies, something to say about a dot. There's always something to say about anything. So the beauty of tweeting is you just go on forever. Someone described it to me as having a goat that you need to uh, keep feeding. And I, I don't think that's far off. No, yes. I, I would, I'd say like a good one third of yours are about what you've had for lunch. And I, well, it's very important. And I feel that uh, luncheon is uh, an important part of the day. Give structure. Uh, and uh, inspires a lot of people onto greatness. Actually. Thanks. Yeah, I think so. And I, I don't know what it is about the way you write, but I think you make your lunch sound interesting every time. Well, it's just, uh, uh, I always find things amusing. Sometimes, sometimes you tweet for yourself and sometimes you tweet for other people. So I find it uh, amusing when people announce stuff all the time. It's like, who cares? Nobody cares. So it started off with, I'm just going to announce stupid stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the public took it to their hearts. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, that, that always amuses me. That there's, there's a great one today, uh, uh, quite a big name uh, announcing something. And it's it's the, the pomposity of, of imagining that anybody gives a damn what you're doing. <laughs> but, of course, social media encourages you to document that. Uh, and that's to me, is funny. Yeah, it's incredible. It's really bizarre that everyone's kind of expected, especially online, to act like their own sort of press officer. Yeah. And as as someone who writes, over time I've taken it less and less seriously because I used to act like anyone that actually gave a shit. But yeah. uh, you're better. You're actually better off, and people actually find it more endearing if you just if you're just honest about it, as opposed to like you say, having the pomposity behind it. Um, yeah, and uh, just tweet through anything. If you're having a bad day, if you've fallen off, as they say online, I'll try not to use a lot of onlineisms, but uh, unfortunately, I'm as guilty as anyone else. They've absorbed into me now, and I can't. Uh, I almost talk in mean. <clears throat> um, but uh, I've completely lost my thread there. Um, yeah, just tweet through it all, whatever it is. Having not that you're having a bad day, but even if you've got nothing to say, say something. I mean, my 11 o'clock, 10 past 11 tweet two days ago, which has gone, I mean, uh, it's gone a bit crazy. It's just something, I could do that another time and it would get five likes, you know. I was a great believer in deleting stuff because I don't want to look at my timeline sometimes. I don't like that, don't like that, don't like that. You get told off for it very often. You stop deleting things. I'm sure, I'm sure there's somebody somewhere uh, documenting me and everybody else. So one day, maybe they'll all come out brilliantly when I least want them to. Yeah, I understand. I, I get weird ones like that where I think, oh, this is an absolute banger. Everyone's going to yeah. love this. And like no one pays any attention. Then you post some absolute fluff. And that's the one that everyone cares. There's almost something um, theological that's about magic it. it. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's absolutely magical. Magic. Because it's like Cain and Abel, right? Like they both mm. give these sacrifices. And God just sat, God just smiles upon one because he likes one for some arbitrary reason, and we don't know why. So maybe that's like the modern theology, or maybe that's maybe that's what um, the story of Cain and Abel was um, 
preparing us for was social media. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'd like to think it was more than that, but I'm happy with that as well. It's possibly. I don't know where Mr. Musk fits in all that then. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Uh, I'm a bit vague right now, but I'm, I'm wondering, like, if you were to introduce yourself, as you probably are to my audience, how are you introducing yourself? How would you introduce yourself? Well, I'll put it there. I'm just an individual, a person. An individual I don't person. have uh, any uh, title, any rank. I'm a nobody. Uh, and quite happily so. Right. Fair enough. But you, but you do have some recent history putting yourself forward for something. <laughs> And I didn't want to talk about this. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get there. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, you were, you were, yeah, uh, sometimes. Well, I, you know, uh, at the age of 53, that's right, I am. Um, you, uh, you wake up in the morning and people say stuff to you and sometimes you respond to it and sometimes you don't. Sometimes that stuff is, do you want to do this? And you say, yes, all right, then. And you do it. So that's I did it. I, I... Yeah, I'm talking about the fact that you stood to be a member of parliament for the SDP party. So you're saying that Absolutely. someone you're having your your <laughs> breakfast. No, no, no. I'm a member of the party. So, yeah, let me do my disclaimer as well. Yeah. So I'm I'm here today not on behalf of the SDP. I'm a member of the SDP. I've uh, put in a local election and a general election. Um, I don't speak on behalf of them. I do support them. I think they're great. I think everyone should have a look into them. Uh, and I apologise for anything I say today. <laughs> so I don't imagine I will. You've got me on a, a, a good time of day. Luckily, I siestized earlier, so I'm fully in control of my faculties. But I'm normally actually sharper at night than I am during the day. Uh, yes, so the SDP uh, party election broadcast, which I did take part in somewhat. Right, OK. But you were, you were a candidate for parliament as well. I was, yeah. Okay, cool. But, but the way you describe it, it's almost like I'm saying it. it's like it's almost like you were, you know, minding your own business, having breakfast one morning, and then you know, from on high, the call for Peter came in, and you picked up the phone, and you're like, they, you didn't want to do it, you were reluctant, but they were begging you. It's like we need you on our side, Peter. Well, I thought you were talking what specifically happened? about the party election broadcast. No, 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 no. Yeah, with with the elections, it's something you decide to do in advance. It's not something you can wake up. Some that some people do a very last minute about it. Yes, I definitely wanted to represent the party um, and spread the word about the party and get as many votes as I can. Uh, it well, wasn't that many, but uh, it, it's all very good. And you make a bit of history sometimes, as myself and my colleague Steve Tanner, the neighbouring borough, let's say, did, <laughs> because uh, nobody had uh, stood for the SDP since I think it was 87 or 85. Uh, so we console ourselves with uh, making a tiny little footnote scratched like a cursed scroll. Uh, right, in right. Heaven. What is it that attracts you to the SDP specifically? Um, I like the leader. I like the structure of the party. I like the democracy involved within it. Uh, I think there's some brilliant brains in it. Uh, I think they're definitely one to watch and will do well and will be represented in Parliament. Um, and that's been borne out over time. Uh, and I think it's an exciting party to be around, um, as are many others that uh, exist or have started to exist. So I think it's uh, with the rot at the top of, uh, of the, the two parties, the way they uh, behave and the state they're in at the moment, I think it is refreshing. There are other parties around. I'm, of course, pro PR. Very much so because I want uh, everybody to be heard, the usual cliches, but even the unpalatable stuff, which is, isn't so unpalatable suddenly <laughs> to many, uh, you've got to hear it. And representation is important. That's about as normy as I get, okay? So make the most of that bit. <laughs> okay, well, speaking of normy, what's the unpalatable stuff? Uh, well, it's unpalatable views, uncomfortable views, uncomfortable solutions, many of which are around. Um, when complacency has set in, when indifference has been allowed to run riot, and when people do very little uh, and things go wrong, 
the solutions to those things become the exact opposite. They become more has to be done. Mm. So the, the, the redefining of everything, and the labels don't even go anywhere near accurately describing uh, the contents uh, these days. So that's why, you know, uh, with people being arrested, the word far right's being thrown everywhere. <laughs> the word democracy is, is uh, will have people talking for an hour about what it is. The word far, the words far right will have people talking for now what it is. What does it mean to be a communist? All those labels, they are very much 20th century politics in a way. Right, yeah. Um, I believe. Sure. I mean, I'm interested in, um, I'm very interested in the elites in general because it's kind of a result of a more managerial way of looking at things. I mean, you can just look at like Rishi Sunak, right? Who's like, he's got the kind of internationalist bank manager vibe going on. And Keir Starmer sort of like the head teacher sort of. And I like, I'm not saying those are, those are bad and unnecessary people for society, but they're not leader types, I wouldn't say. It feels, and I know that's not the, the way to look at things normally, but it feels like neither of them want the job. Mm. Um, but they're very much plugged into their party and they want to succeed. It's it's a sort of comeuppance for the career politician, isn't it? But all right, then you want it so much, you'll go, you're in the lead spot and there you go, run the country. And both of them balked in their different ways. Um, I think, Mr. Starmer is going to be much, I don't want to use the word successful, and Rishi, you know, uh, nobody ever voted for him, as we know, you know, that's down to the famous 1922 committee. But I think um, Mr. Starmer is going to have a much rougher time and will be much less able to cope because uh, um, I suppose a legal mind re re relies on order. And a lot of what is happening and may possibly happen is disorder uh, and a reasonable amount of chaos. And, I, uh, and you can't always, you don't have the time to slot that into the way you do things and run things, just to put it in very basic terms, up into uh, airy fairy today. So I think that's going to increasingly, uh, I think you might, it may have time off with mental health issues. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> or equivalent. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. What I think is. I, I don't I mean, think he's going to cope very well. I mean, Rishi had that. I mean, it's here. It happened. Who knows how, really? Fine. I'm going to be my bouncy, cheery self, which worked on a certain amount of the public. But when uh, you've had a charismectomy, it becomes very difficult. Uh, there is a certain amount of charm necessary in this day and age. In this day and age, there is a certain amount of charm necessary, um, and th that's and it's it's expected of you in public life. Whether that's correct or not, whether that's right or not, whether it ought to be and should be like that or not, it's something else. But there is that factor. I don't believe yeah. this gentleman has it at all. There's two aspects to that as well because. Rishi's interesting because he's got like fairly like almost like a alien pretending to be a human sort of answers to questions yeah. like like his his he always posts about so I don't, is it Southampton he supposedly supports it's very like Something David like that. Cameron who even knows where that is no. possibly <laughs> getting like the wrong um, football team if you ask him a question favorite food being sandwiches and then recently one with Kirsten was really weird when he was asked if he had like a favorite uh, novel or piece of music or something. And his answer was just a flat out no. And yeah, because like, it's, it's everything the miles and the, the PR level. people, and, uh, yeah, and the skills people who buzz around everybody, the entourage. It, we're at such a stage now where I don't say anything. We would rather everyone thought you were boring or mute or uh, anything apart from saying the wrong thing, not realizing that because of things like social media. We're all so advanced, we can pick apart anything now. If you do something, it is damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, and I suggest they do. So at least there's some something meaty for everyone to tuck into rather than doing nothing. There's a Heidi Heidi element to Mr. Starmer. 
and the Labour Party at the moment. It's like, we're not going to say too much till we get into power. And then you, you know us by our actions. Yeah, brilliant. But that, that's the, the country we're talking about. And we don't really want five years of that. So it'd be really handy if you could probably give us a couple of hints before. Uh, it, and it also doesn't help when you've got a, a conservative opposition, which apparently exists, which is like, oh, I could have told you Labour were going to put your taxes up. It's like, brilliant, really good. Yeah, nice opposition there. So uh, the machinery is grinding to a halt now. Yeah, there is. It's not happening the way it ought to happen or should happen. Yeah, uh, and you've got a Heidi Heidi party, which is slowly giving you a little bit and a little bit. And I don't think the public are going to be very happy. With, I don't think Labour voters are going to be very happy with that. And I did get that feeling on election night. I thought, you're going through the motions. I, your heart's not in this. And that's not to disparage the candidate um, here, who's a great lady called Mashada Khan. And she won, and she's a very nice lady. <clears throat> and so Southampton, a nice place, by the way, before half of my Southampton mutuals disappear. I've never been there, but I'm sure it's nice. If it's not, DM me, tell me why it's nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not going to say haywire, but brackets haywire. Everything is not as it should be. The victory was hollow. The Labour Party, as presented in 2024, seems or is hollow, uh, as does the Conservative Party. And I don't think the country's got enough time. Uh, hang on, we just need to get back to what we really stand for. I'm not sure everyone's got time for that, and there are serious problems. But then they want to talk. Uh, uh, the public don't really, the majority of normally people, bless their hearts, they don't want to think about politics all the time. They don't care the state of the Conservative Party. They, they want a party they can vote for the way that they've always voted for them. They want a Labour Party that they can vote for the way they've always voted for them. <clears throat> but they're, they're, they're not delivering. To, the two main parties are absolutely not delivering. And hopefully other parties can do that. Yeah, it's really strange because, you know, speaking about the le election a little bit, like... I mean, I'm no expert. I'm a nobody. I'm just saying stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Neither am I. Neither am I. I'm not an expert. But yeah. all I do know I'm is that Labour cool. got pretty much as many votes as Corbyn got, and they got their so-called landslide. Like, it's not like masses of the country went out and voted for Labour. It's just, it, they got like, it was below 30% still. Like, it's it's not impressive. And what is what you said it is very strange is that in con like contrast to what's, you know, I guess always has been happening in America, there are no, there's no like celebrities and fireworks and whatever in our in our politics whatsoever. And like you said, that could be for a good or a bad reason. And what's strange is actually, I think most people would be pretty happy if there was kind of a a TikTok prime minister who made everything sound okay, as opposed to Keir Starmer, who's going to get up and admit that the country is a shambles and it's going to be a crap five years under him. Like you, I think the British people almost want like a Trump who's going to come out and just lie to them about how it's going to be great. Well, I think Rishi was getting there actually just before he, he left. That that was that's his. Uh, he would be there if he had the charisma for it, but no. Uh, tra the tragedy. Well, he is a victim of uh, as you know everybody is the, the particular circumstances okay. of the moment. Um, and I I don't particularly feel that he was uh, supported. By everyone there. And, and if not him, who? Uh, which we're left with now anyway. But the public wanted to say, well, in the meantime, while you're working that out, well, you're not credible enough for us to vote for you in numbers. And then there's the whole reform thing as well, which is another thing. Um, which uh, I don't know if anyone's feeling any buyer's remorse for having uh, the fact. The fact is, you know, if the, the Conservative vote and the reform vote were together, this would never have happened. That that is a thing. <laughs> it's it's not an, a, a, uh, an accusatory tone I'm using as such. But yes, and I think everybody knew that because there were enough people saying to them, "You realise that you know, if you vote reform, you're going to help usher in uh, Labour," and that is what happened. I don't think it's controversial to say that. Um, which is fine as long as the the reform MPs then go on to. 
tuck into Labour. And I think Mr Farage is, is having a go at it. I can't remember the other people's names, frankly. Mr Anderson, Mr, Mr. Tice, did he get in? Richard Tice is in, yeah. Mr Tice, I don't know what he's um, up to. <laughs> Ooh, who knows? Um, there's another gentleman, isn't there, somebody or other? But, you know, it, you, we have to, if, you, if you're unhappy with this, with the election of this government, just like they would have done had the opposite uh, uh, happened, you have to, you know, you, you have to give it to Labour. They're, they're very organised in their opposition and always have been. Mainly because the, it's very often the state that they're in, that they're in opposition. Uh, so they've honed it to a fine art. And you can't hang around and think, oh, we'll criticise them later, we'll lay into them later. You know, it's got to happen now. Thankfully, they're making such awful decisions already <laughs> um, that they're giving uh, plenty to chew on. So what they're doing is that not much personality or no personality, but plenty of outrageous things. And that's that thing, isn't it? You know, the, the, the most boring dullard can be the most... Uh, dangerous adversary or opponent and that's very much the case uh, very often in life i find a little bit of advice for you then i thought i'd be just uh, doing silly voices actually so i'm not very happy about this at all very serious conversation that's it <laughs> have you have yeah, you so ever been on the stage are you have you ever been a no i got trained as an actor but yeah a little bit iconic Hard and all that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I thought so. I'm just naturally like that anyway. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but yes, I did train years ago. This this might be a question with a really simple answer, but why why are you SDP and not Reform? Uh, I don't like their economics. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. That's the big difference, right? Yeah, and it's you know it's a chasm. It's not a, a little bit of a difference. It, yeah. It's a chasm. Is it correct to describe their economics as, as Thatcherite or maybe even libertarian? Is that fair? It, it is, and I don't think that's. I don't think anyone. I, mean, I think anyone who was a, a member of Reform who found that uh, an offensive or odd remark or took exception to it, I would find that very odd. Because, you know, they're quite openly so. Uh, Mr. Tice has been. Uh, Mr. Farage has been since the year dot. Um, but these are. Just like in every party, you know, they're not all intelligent, but some of them are, always are. And I think, how on earth do you imagine, there's a Ms. Truss uh, as well, how do you imagine you could ever create those conditions again? Because they weren't just down to the, create, to the conditions in Britain, they were down to conditions in America and all sorts of things happening around the world. Right. You can't just re the economy. Yeah, and also, I guess, suppose you have to consider the fact that if you do defer to the market, whether the market is going good or bad is going to be upstream of how you're doing, basically, right? Like, if you adapt Thatcherite policies in a different time, it might go very badly, but in another time, it might go very well, right? Yeah, and, and also, what, what is the market now? It's, it's more complicated, isn't it? The, 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 its very existence is such, the way it exists now, is su it's far more complex and layered. Um, and you, you could, certain things will always be true, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, yes, brilliant. The entrepreneurial spirit, spirit now could be a 16-year-old messing around on the internet and earning a fortune on Bitcoin, I don't know what. Uh, right. Which is very, very different from I pulled pull myself up from my bootstraps. I started my company. I now employ two hundred people, and I don't think I should pay much tax. Yeah, it, it's a different way. So that's what I'm saying. The labels don't uh, don't clearly define <clears throat> anymore, in my view, uh, because everything has changed to such a degree. Brilliant that it's changed. I mean, that's good. Oh, just one thing I was going to say about conservatism. Sorry, earlier. Can I say? Can I ramble off? Ramble away. Okay. I've heard recently that there's a quite, quite a lot of people saying, oh, conservatism isn't, I think, uh, defining what it is. And you get the various uh, uh, groups within it. And a Burkean, I'm this, that's Bretonian. Conservatism, it, it, if you want to see it in practice, go to a small island, go to a Greek island, you probably go to a Scottish island. 
Conservatism is about doing the same thing again and again and again and not changing it. It, it relies on a body of people doing that. I don't know why they keep saying it, that's not that at all now. And this is where the Conservative Party, I think, is, uh, is uh, taking some odd directions. Because the, the main body of people have to be people that are happy to do the same thing again and again. <laughs> that's a fact. That's how things don't change in on the whole. And then within that, you can you can move it a little bit over time. You can adapt and evolve. But this business of, oh, no, it doesn't mean that at all, which is uh, I'm hearing. Uh, I can't give you examples at the moment. But it's not convenient for me to do so. <clears throat> um, but there, there's a lot of talk of that. And I, I do worry about uh, that's why conservatism lies elsewhere. I mean, literally, the SDP is far more conservative than the Tory party as is now. Absolutely, 100%. It's not even a, that's not me setting the party or anything like that. I'm not on commission, <coughs> funded by anybody. Uh, where I'd be drinking crook during this. Uh, you have to have a body of people doing the same thing all the time. And we forget how many people want to do that. Of course, anyone who's gone through a change program at work or something like that will tell you that. People don't want to change. They want to do the same thing again and again. <clears throat> so uh, progressive, uh, there used to be a strand of progressiveness that says, OK, but slowly just stretch this way. But progressiveness now seems to go right down the other end of the dial. And it's zero to 100 because many people, for more generalizations, uh, have been waiting in the wings for a long time. And many people who never thought their voice would be promoted, supported, heard, used as policy, are having their day in the sun now. They never thought they would have that. They never thought that they would have this much clout. But the, the way things changed and the nature in, in which they changed uh, meant the progressivism became an express train. I don't think any, anyone has... Uh, people want the country to progress, but what's happened is the country's not progressing at all. The, the, the side issues are progressing, but they what do they contribute to a country? So all we keep saying to sell ourselves anyway is it could be diversity or it could be the look at the makeup of people that exist within the country. I'm like, is that the only thing we're going to sell ourselves on? Is that the best? That, is that it? It's a thing. But is that it? Sorry. Carry on. No, there's two things from that. I do think they're connected. Um, the, the first thing, just to rewind to the economics a little bit, is that yeah. the things you said is it's true that the economy has become incredibly abstract, I would argue. That's both in the digital sense and also the sense that, well, all the economists and the government are looking at things like GDP and, oh, great, line is going up. But it's apparent that that doesn't have an effect on the majority of people's lives. And most people who hold things that are reflected in the GDP are, are you know, wealth management firms and, you know, people who hold property and those sorts of things. And it's, it's very clear that, I'd say in the West, but in the US and the UK, social mobility is just gone. There's no social mobility anymore. And yeah, okay, you get, like you said, you get the occasional Bitcoin millionaire or whatever. But that's almost like going down to the casino and seeing how social mobility goes there, isn't it, really? Um, well, yes, it's, it's, and that's a bit like uh, what the 25 years, let's call it that for shorthand, of the internet has done. It, it was like a casino everyone entered, thinking, well, I'm going to get something out of it. I'm certainly not going to go away with nothing. Yeah. And I, I, I did a tweet the other day, which got five likes. Uh, and I thought, well, actually, I was being dread deadly serious. I said, the internet is shedding its skin, which it, it this is the kind of tectonic plate movement we're talking about at the moment. After 25 years of internet and having it define who we are or maybe how we make money and everything else, I, th I feel the sun is setting on that to some degree. Mm. We're going to something else. I don't know. I can't really uh, uh, describe the, the void as such at the moment, but I do feel that change particularly uh, keenly. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. I'm a dreadful interrupter. No, there's a lot, a lot of threads. Yeah, it feels like it's almost entering a 
or it has been in a pupil stage and it's coming out and something else is being bought because you don't really Absolutely. go to a website anymore do you i remember when you used to go to like www dot something but everything seems to be in a way in connected interconnected but also siloed like when you're in x you're kind of trapped in x and x followers don't translate <laughs> somewhere else and it's it's very strange um and it's very different to the internet i knew and also the internet that kind of crescendoed when i was um because i studied computer science and i right. did it when bitcoin was really taking off so a lot of my interest in that was based on that and that sure. seems like the crescendo of the decentralized version of the internet right the wild west internet the website internet even and it does feel like it's a different animal now and i think it's going to perhaps get abstracted in a sense that you're not even going to know that you're using that as a protocol anymore um, but it's just advertising isn't it there's no information like google searches i mean it's about who controls the information i know that's a huge topic and i'm certainly not qualified to talk on anything like this but to speak on that <laughs> but when they start saying that you know the, the way google search for example works now what it used to bring up and what it will bring up now because as soon as you monetize something and say well if you give us some dosh you know we'll make sure that your uh, listing goes toward the, to the top it's already it's over <laughs> um and as long as a few people and this i'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist in the slightest uh more a conspirer really um uh um if the pe if you if you can't can't trust the people who hold the information because it's almost at that stage now that there's just a blob of information and a, a handful of people own it mm. and you're in their hands it, it's um how would you ever how will we ever work our way back to impartiality in anything again after the internet yeah the, the word ownership is kind of act, apt right because we've gone through this revolution where people are no longer property and then the most important thing now is information and data and eyeballs and attention and that the is now becoming, yes if you're becoming right. re-owned again so it's almost like a slavery by a different name and it's it's a soft slavery because if anyone who's i've had to delete them from my phone now anyone who ha who's had TikTok or instagram or whatever installed at any point is you you go to it and you fall down this rabbit hole and you look at the clock and you spend an hour looking at like pithy short videos and you ask people what they were watching and they can't tell you Yes, I mean, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, psychology and science behind it. They've worked out it literally. But they've, they've tried to mind map everybody. What, what you know, are ultimately the algorithms and things, what are they? They're, they're these predictors. Um, I do believe if you have a strong character, you can sort of override that. Hmm. What does bother me is and I don't want to be boomery, I'm not going to do it, but a whole generation that's only known that. Yeah. How has it sculpted their thinking? Um, and how resistant would that make them to, to perhaps what might be necessary in the coming years, which is independent, I'll use the word revolutionary as such, independent outspoken forthright thought action behavior um how does that shackle your intelligence does it leave you with any um and how do you become an individual within all that because that's literally how they used to torture people is to put them in a room and flash images up again and again and, again. and we're lit and we're doing it to ourselves so what is that doing to us does it change the nature of, of, of our brains i know a lot of people are looking into that as i say i'm not a conspiracy theorist but it, it is does uh it is worth pointing out that that is a thing <clears throat> I mean, it, to, to such a degree that, you know, the church is doing it as well. The churches are doing it as well. 
and I was listening to a, a priest the other night talking about uh, talking about this, and it, it was quite interesting. But I don't suppose uh, you're going to want to go there today, and I suggest we don't, because I can go on for a long time about that kind of thing. <laughs> we might have to have faith in a part two, perhaps. Um, no. I, I did. <laughs> I, did. <laughs> I did want to mention, as someone who was once. Um, perhaps a utopian perhaps an idealist of various stripes one important skill i have learned is to realize that the whole point of a machine is its outputs right is the things it actually does right. and one thing i noticed i guess about free market economics but i guess you could say thatcherism is that it claims to do all these things it claims to allow people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and whatever and okay maybe that's true in certain environments but over time, whether it's, you know, the change of technology, maybe it's the change of demographics, maybe it's the, basically the fact that we're in a bit of a economic, just meh, malaise, right? Like, it's not like, it's not the fifties anymore, right? Like there's not optimism. That has been chattel classes and a complete lack of social mobility. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just kind of interested in, cause I suppose, the SDP, and I, I would guess your opinion is is different from that. So, how how is where do you differ from free market Thatcherism specifically? Oh, I haven't even taken a maths exam, so you've really got me on the wrong uh, topic. <laughs> the social market economy that they uh, propose and support, however, uh, is is different, and I can't I can't do it now. I have to sit there with somebody who's uh, corrects me on certain things. Well, I say them. So it, it is a completely way, a, a, a completely different way of looking at it. Uh, it's more like the pu private public partnerships in uh, in other areas. So it respects the market in certain things. You know, it says leave some things alone to happen. It respects the market, but it isn't enslaved to the market. The economy isn't enslaved to the market only, um, and and can. Uh, has a whole other raft of measures that aren't dependent on the market. That's as far as I'm going because uh, I'll, I'll say the wrong thing. And they'll all laugh at me. They probably switched off now. By the when is this coming out? <laughs> People tend not to listen past about thirty seconds. So I wouldn't worry too much. Um, <laughs> that's just that's just the stats, man. That's just the stats. That's technology right there. Um, I am inter I'm, in I'm interested because I. Like I said, over time, I can't give you that answer, which I feel sorry to let you down on. But uh, no, there's no I, I yeah, I wanted to hear about boring economics with with Peter today. That's all I wanted. Well, I wish I'd even taken a maths exam, which I never have <clears throat> of any kind. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. Shocking, really. Shocking me, and I've worked for two banks. But there we go. Wow, tells you all you need to know about banks, right? Absolutely. Tells you. Okay. I did want to rewind what you were saying about conservatism, though, because yes. it's very true that it's um, a really important topic. I mean, you know, forget the Conservative Party, but conservatism. Well, I, we live on an island, which we do here, islands, the islands that constitute the United yeah, Kingdom. Yeah. It's a really important topic. I think I think so, and I sort of after the realization of you know Thatcherism claims to do all these things, or free market claims to do all these oh, things. Oh yes, yes, it doesn't do any of them conservatism well okay we've got a thing called the conservative party which hasn't been yep. conservative for 15 years now like it yep. hasn't conserved anything in fact it's been more progressive and accelerationist than what came before it which is it's easier to focus on those things that's why they're all doing it because it's just easier to focus on those things. it's easier to go on about banning smoking than it is to actually address uh, immigration uh housing they would you know so they will keep doing that and as long as we're all including me going up in arms about those things we're, we're beautifully distracted politics right. yeah. cannot work the way it does when something like thatcherism comes along which nobody even said was thatcherism at the time it was just did in power and things are happening you know, there was nothing and then the falklands war and that's when it all began the victory there uh, imbued her with a sense of leader power capability <clears throat> so then we sat back and uh, bought uh, uh, imported american economics or some homegrown stuff as well and it was only after that that so the liner of political movement sort of goes away and it's only in the in the wake of all that which is 10 years or more 
that you can actually define what it was. People still can't really define Thatcherism clearly today. Some, in fact, say that there's no such thing. Uh, so it takes a long time to, you know, what, what do we know about Blairism? The, the scary part about what's happening now is we didn't even work out what Blairism was then, let alone now people like Peter Hitchens will say the, the opposite, of course. And, you know, there's a great degree of truth in a lot of what he says. Um, these isms, what are they? Right. Uh -huh. no. Yes, sorry, did I cut you off? No, I think I think you're right to kind of bring out the fact that people do talk in isms a lot and it alienates a lot Desperate of people. Desperate to define. Desperate to define. Right. Uh huh. And then like I guess I say a Thatcherism and we both probably have a slightly different idea of what that means in our heads, right? Yeah, I mean I uh, yeah, I wasn't that old at the time, but you know, there were a few good years, but the boom years, you know? Right. Well, I remember them very clearly. It sort of it felt like it happened. I seem to have felt it as a teenager at the time. It felt like it happened overnight. Like you woke up one day and the sun was shining and everyone was suddenly making money or able to make money. Um, and because everyone was making money, they were a bit happier. Unfortunately, there's a whole generation of people, normally my age and a bit older, who couldn't can't get over that. And I think um, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging reform here, but there is a certain <laughs> percentage of reform voter that's just like, can't we just have that back? I mean, anyone who can promise me that back, I will vote for. So whether it's invoking just the name Thatcher, talking about the uh, uh, Thatcherite policies, it was, uh, I used to think that they probably hated it when they were called a Thatcherite tribute band or these, these uh, disparaging comments. But I think they enjoy it because just invoking certain names, that's why Keir Starmer took the, the painting down. Because the power of even just having <laughs> Margaret Thatcher's photo there, it freaked him out. Mm -hmm. He didn't want the weight of responsibility that those, those eyes <laughs> staring at him gave. <laughs> I'm joking. Why do you think then? Why do you think? I mean, like you said, you mentioned that what was going on then is kind of just what was going on in the country. It's kind of got more to do with the fact that there was, you know, America doing its thing externally, way bigger, way bigger fish than us. That's kind of really what it's down to. So why do you think that Thatcher has such a psychic power over both people who love her and people who think that she's the devil because in a way uh, i mean there's, there's even uh, whether she was a true conservative or not all that whole argument as well i have to qualify everything before you say it but maybe she did have that happy mix of tradition and progress progress was you can buy a council house the tradition was you know uh things that would drive everyone uh not to then have everybody on the street, things like Section 28, things like, uh, you know. So she was, maybe that's the accelerating and clutch of progressivism that is acceptable within the, under the conservative umbrella. Maybe that's the limit of it. Being both popular, winning high votes, sustainable, maybe that was the peak of it so the rose color spectacles perhaps looking through them that's what you see um but you can't you can't have i don't think you can have a, a thatcher or thatcherism without a reagan and reaganism but just to hit the, the isms in a big way and everything else that was going on you can't see these things in isolation i mean you can you can try you're wasting everyone's time and now because of globalization because of i don't even want to say the boomer internet but the boomer internet everything is relevant all the time so when people say something about little england or sometimes i'm like oh well, god i'm sure some people wish <clears throat> you're not a little anything you know If you've got a screen, you've got access to the world and the way the world thinks. Interestingly enough, it hasn't really led to many revolutions. I know we had a little 
flurry of it. Um, I'd been abroad at the time. And I came back in uh, 2010 in Egypt and here and there. Um, and, and sometimes it's used to uh, pull people to arms. And I sometimes think, look, uh, with the gift of hindsight, of course, uh, is that was that the, the best the internet could be, actually? as the, uh, 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 disseminating uh, ideas and information so that people could uh, somehow revolt, change, bring about change. Uh, because that's what change looks like. You know, change isn't uh, having Rishi Sunak as a conservative leader. And it, it, it's uh, um, David Starkey, um, Professor Stark, he said some, uh, I'm sure he says it quite often, but I've only caught him a couple of times saying it, uh, something in London, and he said, you know, all revolutions are bad, in other words. <clears throat> and you've got to hand it, that's a, that's a conservative viewpoint for you. All revolutions are bad. Uh, I, I suppose that it's interesting because it raises something you mentioned earlier about the fact that maybe there's a younger generation who doesn't know any better but i would sort of i would actually put this but this is kind of my opinion basically is a more slightly elitist way of looking at things which is that actually the majority of humanity isn't isn't cut out to be um truth seekers reading about whatever abstract ideals or whatever they're actually made for the trough they're actually they're actually made to be cattle Ah, oh, which well, this is yeah. Yeah, interesting. What I'm one. saying is that, as as opposed to be, you know, being given the tools of revolution, which I think the internet is a potential tool of revolution. But the problem is, it's also a tool of enslavement, and people prefer the the majority of people prefer the enslavement side of things. And I it's a very dark thought and mm. goes against some of the nice ideals we might like to. Um, believe in if we live in a place where everyone gets a vote, for example. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the the worst thing that the internet did is it, it made everyone think, I'm going to say an awful, outrageous thing now, but stay in your lane. That doesn't mean you never aspire to anything or never get on in life, but stay in your lane if, if, if more I'm I'm happy to say it. I don't care who goes to me afterwards. If more people just got on with who the, who they are from their environment and hung around in that, and were the good old reliable butcher that everyone could go to or something like that, but nobody wants that. Everyone wants the stars and the peddling the peddling of dreams and the disappointments that come when everyone realizes no that you, everyone can't be in the elite. Yeah. Uh, that's been, and it's, as I say, it's 25 years of the internet, it will take. <clears throat> so after 25 years of the internet, people are finding that a very bitter pill to swallow. I'm glad they are. Um, there's nothing, I, I want a recent, I personally, not for my, like I said, I have no status, I'm nobody. Um, but when people are more content with exactly what they've got around them and they realise that, you know what, I don't need to go and live in London, do this or whatever. I'm all right where I am. But we need to support and help them create the conditions they can do that if they want to. And be very gentle with the younger generation who's who have been buffeted, cosseted, and ultimately, some people, by the way, disappointed now. I'm very, very concerned about people younger than me. Um, and I think you do need to treat them uh, very carefully. And I don't like people my age and above who are very dismissive of them and think that they're having a great time. Uh, the psychological torture <laughs> they've gone through with the various iterations of the internet and social media, um, I don't think, uh, I wouldn't want anyone to go through that. However, I mean, if you forgive everybody everything. But they've gone through gone through a very tough time and things like lockdown and, and stuff like that. So be nice to younger people is what I always tell people my age and above. 
because they can be very dismissive. And it's no good saying when I was your age, this and that, that, that. It's never been a time where that is less appropriate to say to someone right. younger than you, unless they approach you and say, well, what happened when you were young, for God's sake? I don't think anyone uh, should be lecturing anybody younger than them now at this period, saying when I was your age, this and that, but it doesn't apply. Yeah. The post-war uh, life, the, de the decades that, that, that um, succeeded uh, the Second World War, in a sense, the past couple of years have been the death knell of that. It's very sad, in a way, because it defines so many people. And it still defines the politics, it still defines a lot of the, the big stuff. But uh, in terms of the humans that were left to mop it up and how they lived their lives and recreated them and how they developed, that generation of people thinking is dead and the young ones are right to say so it's painful and they say it on either side of the political uh, so it, it's painful it's painful to take but i i think i think they're correct and the zoomers shall inherit the earth <laughs> that wise, right um speaking of inheriting something yes you mentioned conserving things and you said yeah. it has to be done by people yes what do you mean by people? Because there's a lot well, of... I think if the government doesn't do that, if you live a certain yeah. way, and you as a community, this is why communitarianism yeah. is, is quite um, interesting, and that side of the SDP is very interesting as well. Oh. Um, although I'm not saying they exist like this, um, but, but going back to what I said about people who live on islands, um, I've got a connection to another island apart from England, and it's a small one, it's in Greece, smallish. And I lived there for a while. Hated it. Don't tell anyone that. No, I didn't. I, I love parts of it and hated other parts of it. But I used to say to people, they always say the same thing there. You say to somebody, how are you? You say, um, what do you think I am? I'm always doing the same thing. I'll be doing the same thing yesterday, tomorrow, and in 10 years. And they love it. And they love it because they know not only are they doing the same thing, but the old woman who walks past at 10 past seven every morning, it will be 10 past seven tomorrow morning. It's the same thing again and again and again. When that happens, that is not drudgery, enslavement, or it. You're so sick. And what happens is you're so secure in everybody doing the same thing at the same. We used to have in England, by the way, it wasn't that long ago. I'm not saying return to the 50s, by the way. <coughs> And it probably started to disintegrate by then. But it those are the pillars of your life that you know certain things are going to happen at certain times. You know exactly where you can go to buy something. Yes, there's some change. People die and people move on, and some people prosper and other people don't. But the the, the heart of a of a village, of a town, um has those generations of people who do the same thing all the time. You can't ask anyone to do anything for a day, including people my age, by the way. But they've lost that ability. I think people in their 50s uh, and the, the boomers uh, will never let you know what they're doing. They've become very secretive because they're, they're um, petrified in case someone says they've got a lot of money. <laughs> so they're all hidey hiding away in their bars at the end of the garden having drinks and stuff like that. Yeah, but um, I think even... It's not as suffocating as you think, and it's quite freeing in the end. And I've I've noted people who were in their twenties when I first knew them in Greece, were now in their fifties, who are like, "I'm so glad I stayed and did what I do all the time." Um, you have to accept with some of that that you're probably going to be poorer than your contemporaries. um can you can you cope with less i mean uh, you've got the instagram life telling you to eat bugs and live in a pod and it's like well hang on a minute there's another way of doing that and it's the conservative way of doing that and it means you look after your own you look after your family you don't have massive inspirations get married you have a you know a wedding in a, in a pub or something not a 30 grand wedding everyone loves you everyone hates you you know all those natural 
animosities that are the, the natural things that happen in a community but in a community you can never afford to make large enemies this is something i learned on an island because you're going to see them every day so what happens is people blow up and they get over it whereas a peripatetic lifestyle um very often changes someone's character uh such that they don't have that uh sense of well i just want to get this off my chest and then tomorrow we're all fine with each other i think a small community living or island living i think the more we remember we're an island the better we will fare right it's something i've, I've struggled with a little bit though because I'm British, but I'm also English, right? Yeah. I feel, you know, there's there's Welsh people and there's Scottish people who also live on our island, right? Yeah. yeah. And what I find very difficult about Britain... Yes, I'm listening. ...is it's much... The definition of what you can, what you can be and join that is much wider. Is? And is much wider, right? Oh, it's, wider, yeah, yeah, yeah more of a proposition of a nation and i'm not saying it was started as a proposition maybe you think that the british empire kind of fell into place because everything went well i don't know i don't even care at this point why, why that was right what i'm saying is that there is very clearly english people there's very clearly welsh people there's very clearly scottish people they very clearly have cultures towns, they live in, uh, towns where people have families have lived there for hundreds of years yes um, and but britain to be british you can be <laughs> Rishi Sunak, for example. It's almost like it's it's an yes, it's an existence that isn't uh, rooted in the island. It's just as long as you've got the title, it sort of floats somewhere above the island. Yeah, uh, and it exists in a in a bubble, and it, it's an almost untouchable and unreachable bubble. But once you're in it, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they they don't want anyone. It's so odd. It's so odd to me. To me. Uh, I thought we'd cut off then. Like someone like Greece, where they absolutely, everyone, you know, Ash Sarka uh, said something about a village in Italy where they were doing something to do with saints and uh, everything else. It was obviously a saint's day. And she was there and she was saying, look at the tradition. I'm like, that's exactly what if uh, uh, um, uh, an English person, a Welsh person or a Scots person did that, everyone would be taking the mickey out of. Yeah. So it's fine when it's abroad. That's where they were, where the pro Europeans who feel that you know we left the European Union that that they were somehow connected to that without looking around at their own. <clears throat> you can't you can't be ashamed of your country. Yeah. If you are, do what so many people from other countries did. You go, don't you? Go and make a life elsewhere. And there are genuinely people in England who, uh, they never prosper here, but they prosper really well abroad. And good luck to them. And the, the reasons for that may be very different. And I don't mean about studying. I mean, people who literally uh, go abroad, but very often people come back within five years anyway to the UK because nothing, nothing replaces Blighty. Let me tell you that. I've only felt her homesick for a country once in my life. And it was a most awful feeling. I couldn't get over it. And I was like, I need to leave. I need to be in England now. Um, and it really crystallizes your character, actually, and how you feel about your country to, to ever feel yeah. really homesick. And it's, uh, I don't say it lightly, it's an awful thing. It, um, it's had more effect on me. I mean, because the, uh, the country is a contradiction, right? This is, this is why I brought it up, because You've got this internationalist Britain, the modern, like progressive, I guess, kind of half European, half Americanized states, but you also have England. And I'm someone who sort of left rural England, became an urbanite, you know, became more international. And as I've gotten further away from my roots, uh, as you say, I've, I've longed for them more, but I find it it's it's diff it's difficult because and it's it's very much against what what the world is turning into because i almost feel not just i'm not being exclusivist and saying oh only english people should be in england because that's that's ridiculous and 
would be just again it's like people wishing for a previous time it's ridiculous it doesn't make any sense but what i'm saying is it is well, I, think, I think the people that say like that the, the people that say that should be listened to this is that you know i am a slightly controversial figure and i think that everyone should be listened to and i want i, I want to hear those voices i don't i don't say i want to agree with them but i would definitely want to hear everybody's voice on the matter anyway, carry sure, on. Sure. what i'm saying is i wouldn't go as far as that but i do think it's like a normative good when you go to england there should be english people and there should be english food and english traditions right like when i go to paris i want there to be french people and french food and of french course traditions. like when i go to like but it, uh, but it relies on you perpetuating those traditions what are you doing you have one has to ask oneself what am i doing within my to perpetuate that yeah rather than just turning up you know this is what they always say uh, uh, take the, the mickey out of people in, in greece to go to little villages once a year when there's a saint stay it's like we don't see you the rest of the time you're in america or whatever so it's a very good example of that because a huge amount of the population cleared off and they pick and choose the bits they like out of the culture right <clears throat> but for it to survive and persevere which is uh, uh pretty much where we're at <clears throat> you have to keep doing the same thing what did i say earlier you have to keep doing the same thing if you you know it's the 12th this is what we do on the 12th we go and sing at some trees or whatever it is we go and smash some sticks together this is not to belittle anything by the way I'm just using a shorthand whatever it is keep doing it now in 2024 uh that's almost immaterial it's like let's look at the makeup of people who are doing it and let's add to it change it mess around with it because if it's a, a real tradition then it will survive that i just i've never known in any other country that i can think of who puts themselves over the coals like that what why would you have a problem talking about anybody who is in England from an English family going back, I don't know how many years? Why would that be such a... And also hostility is... A, I just wanted to say as well, sorry, I'm uh, not ordering it correctly. Um, what I wanted to say to Ash Sarkar, but you know, it's, tw it's Twitter, is um, also there's a hostility that goes, conservatism it has within it, by its nature, a hostility to outsiders. That's how also you keep a preserve a village, keep traditions going, that's how it goes abroad. Very, you know, they'll possibly let you in, it depends who you are and how you behave, especially how you behave, especially how you behave. <clears throat> but you're not guaranteed just because you've ever rolled up that you're going to be accepted into everything. That's the interesting thing about immigration, were it the, the, the opposite in very, uh, in very many of the cases, you can be accepted in the same way. But uh, th there seems to be an, in, uh, an incumbency upon the English character to roll your sleeves up and uh, put up with anything that's thrown at you, and it's it wasn't. It's this isn't spoken about much, but it what, that isn't necessarily the the English character that I remember growing up. Just to to be a boomery about it for a minute. Um, there is a. Uh, an exclusionary nature to conservatism, is, is there not? Because you, you start, you, uh, uh, when you talk about dilution, dilution of a culture, is that a real thing? And how, you know, how many empires have, uh, have died because of it? But people get terribly upset if people want to preserve things or preserve things aggressively. But is that not at the heart of so much successful, successful 
conservatism. I'm not advocating anything. I'm just uh, my experience of seeing how conservatism on the ground is successful has those elements. Sorry, I didn't mean to drag everything down by being a, a very emphatic way of speaking as well. No, it's, it's interesting. I don't know why you uh, almost uh, backpedal yourself. I think I don't know. It's We seem so... It, this goes into loads of things like self-hatred, right? But we seem to yeah. be as a culture, we're so reluctant to just say, no, some things are this way and some things are that. So you, yeah, and some so, so no, you look at the, from the, the word no as well has disappeared almost from the language. <laughs> I mean, it's very good, really. It's another one for another time, maybe. But <clears throat> the word no seems to have disappeared. No one wants to be told no about anything. Mm. So it's not only that the, the boundaries of the country that are a problem, the mental boundaries that there shouldn't be any. They, um, I can never remember the difference between equity and equality. I'm sure you can because you're a clever guy. But uh, in in the in the the search, the rush to harmonise, the word no doesn't happen. No, you can't do that. Interestingly enough, a Labour government's just come in to start saying no. Yeah. But so good luck, good luck, Labour government and Mr. Starmer, because a whole general forget me, I'm flexible with the now. I can take a no, I can take discipline. <laughs> but you've got generation people who have not been taught no very often. Mm. The, the beginning of the no, the big no, the reintroduction of no into society was lockdown. Yeah. Because yeah. you never had so many no's on a plate <laughs> in a short uh, succession. It was a no sandwich. Uh, no sandwich, I'm afraid, and no decorative crisps. <coughs> um, so people had, uh, well, I've said that, you know, that no is, is incredibly offensive these days. Can I join your gang? No. Can I stay here? No. Do you accept me? No. No. It's too close to the cardinal sin of uh, discrimination, though, isn't it? Well, with a small d, you wonder uh, discriminates. It, you know, what is discrimination without going into the? Uh, <clears throat> it's saying yes to you, no to you. But we're, again, the conservative societies that are successful—that's what they say. Yeah, you're okay. I think you're all right. I don't think you're all right. None of us think you're all right. So bugger off. What's happening is a, a tiny, really comparatively tiny amount of people are being intransigent on the subject and have, with a very strong view on the subject. And I think they're being hounded, actually. Um, and I think they should be allowed to speak on the subject, as uncomfortable as that makes anybody feel. Because I tell you what really makes people feel uncomfortable is the poverty, <laughs> is poverty. Um, is their culture the feeling that their culture is slipping away or diluted or downgraded? You cannot, and you know, this is where uh, Starkey is absolutely right. He said, you know, the, they're not, it's not protection of minorities, it, it is the promulgation and the uh, promotion and the protection. Uh, that's what, how it appears to have been applied. Uh, this is also the problem, uh, to go back to Starmer again, you know, uh, with a, a, a legal mind, let's say, that he has, there's the law and there's the application of the law. And a great chasm exists between the two. And rebellion is strong in these islands. Mm. It is. I don't believe that's been stamped out of the national character in the slightest. Um, so good luck to anyone who, but that doesn't make me, you know, like a nice Scottish guy who's on a, you know, um, GB News. Uh, I'm not a libertarian, I'm not a 
but I, I, I do know, I do know the character of the people of these islands because I took time to actually, you know, look and watch and listen and not think about myself all the time. And I don't believe, I don't believe that they're going to stand certainly what's ahead in the next five years or any equivalent. Cool. I agree. Very good. Um, what I did want to ask you about, and then we'll just, just, just disconnect this from the SDP, because I did, just did want to ask you about this. So was it your first time running for parliament? Uh, last May was. OK, interesting. OK. Um, what was it like? Because I'm imagining, like, if I'm thinking about the stereotype, I'm imagining, like, a big rosette and you're, like, knocking on, like, <laughs> old people's doors. Was that what it was like? Like, did you do much of that? Um, yes, there is that. What I would say to young people as well, uh, you know, but I just want to say uh, well done to all the small parties because it's not until you're in a smallish party or small party you realise uh, how much resource and financial resource, human power, you know, the large parties have and they have a great deal. Um, you know, they can literally fly, um, uh, I was going to say flying pickets for a minute. They can uh, bring you 30 people overnight to go and leaflet. They can start a campaign six months in advance. Small parties, you don't have that luxury. And I've got a lot of help, by the way, and thank you to everyone who did help me. And there are a lot of new parties out there who are probably going through the same thing or went through the same thing at the election. So, yes, absolutely. You pin a rosette on yourself and you go and talk to people. If you can, if you have the time and resource to do so, so if not, you have to cut your cloth according to um, what you see on the news of people, you know, within the two main parties going around. That that'll cost money, you know, and they're flying from with helicopters and things like that. So you have to work out within your constituency or ward, if it's a local election, just how much you can apply yourself to the task and how successful you can be. Um, you possibly doing that completely on your own. Uh, we, we, I'm, she's not, I'm not saying boo-hoo, quite the opposite, but you, you've got to have that. Um, I would absolutely, absolutely recommend it, just to be boomery for a sec again, to young people should stand for parliament, especially if you're a member of a party anyway. It's really good for you. It's good for your confidence, real confidence. I don't mean Instagram, I look good in this picture confidence. I mean real confidence. Um, and it will scare you, which is good for you. <clears throat> and you will feel uh, elated, uh, which is good for you. And you'll feel very depressed, which is also good for you in small measure. So I very much recommend it because it's great a uh, life experience. So yes, you do. Uh, there's a great, a great difference between the locals and uh, the general. I and mean, in the general, you know, you've got a hustings and things like that. Sometimes there's stuff organised for local stuff, but it's a lot more low key. <clears throat> and it's interesting the amount of votes that people get in on. You know, people, you know, councillors get in on, I don't know, 1,500 votes. Um, they're not paid, of course. Uh, whereas, of course, the, the MP job, which is why it's been attractive to people. And, of course, if they put the money up, it would be even more attractive to career politicians. I mean, they are, they have been, and will continue to be, and we're at the apotheosis of it now. Uh, the, de the death knell of politics in this country, and that is the career politician. No conviction whatsoever. Right. Or, you know, this blank canvas that they can just pin, pin things on and quickly sketch in a bit of conviction later on. There are other people who can do that for you. They're like, well, just will you do the job? Can you say the right things? Can you keep your box sharp? Can you keep a clean record? Right, your role, this one will have him, her, uh, whoever it is. And it is an absolute disgrace. Sorry, uh, you were asking me specifics about uh, the locals. Do you want to speak about locals? I don't there's any funny encounter stories, but I'm also interested oh. in social media con uh, confidence because I'm wondering, because if you were just looking at social media, you think Britain was in flames, there's working class riots going on all the time, there's migrants uh, jumping off boats and stabbing the first white person they see. Like, 
Uh, and, and you think that um, everyone who votes for Labour wants to kill everyone who votes for reform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, oh, how no, everyone's very charming. You know, everyone's very, for a start, everyone's very nice. Look, you're all going through the same thing. It's like, I didn't go to boarding school, but I went to a, 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 a posh school, but it wasn't a boarding school. It was, but I didn't board. Um, so there's that camaraderie that you only get in extreme circumstances. <laughs> right. Um, and and uh, sort of uh, respect begrudging or not. Uh, that comes with it, and uh, everyone's very kind to you. What I would say is, you know, uh, councils are get a lot of knocking, but they really come into their own. Normally, the department that is really nice within a council and really works well, the very dedicated people, is electoral services, mm. and it's I'm not no small. Uh, I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say it's an absolute privilege to work with the people at Medway Council, where I am. They are absolutely brilliant. They make you feel capable <laughs> worthy <clears throat> um and they it's like the best admin backup you ever had you know they they help you with everything and that's very much needed for somebody like me who forgets stuff uh yeah you did you get people uh saying awful things to you uh people don't tend to say awful things to me i've very, been very nice and cuddly today but i'm always like that um so they don't always say awful stuff to me. But, but some people try their luck a bit and get a bit gobby and everyone thinks they're a, an armchair politician at times. Um, I, th I think the worst thing actually is not somebody calling you every name under the sun. The worst thing is somebody who wants to go into the history, either the history of your party <laughs> and talk for an hour about that. Uh, if I had to say, you know, if this was an if this were an interview and I had to give my weaknesses, I my you know my fuse is very short with that. I'm like, okay, you're brilliant. You've obviously thought about this, and that's excellent. <clears throat> Please vote for me or go away. <laughs> Which I don't think you're supposed to do it like that. <laughs> I'm not saying I said that to anybody. I didn't say that to anybody. <laughs> well, speaking of which, I think it's fair to say the SDP didn't do great. And oh no, they did. Uh, um, the best they've done in years. This is the thing as well, you, you know, the internet doesn't, you know, it encourages and fosters, doesn't it? Everyone's a winner or a loser, L or W, L or W all the time. Uh -huh. So actually they did really well. Um, of course the reform vote affected everybody. Right. So the big news of this election was, oh, look at that body of people that, that voted reform and imagine what anyone could do with that. Um, I hope the leaders of reform do something interesting with that, otherwise it will bleed away and go elsewhere. <laughs> for, the, for the sake of the people that, you know, send money to the party and voted for them. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, the, waste, the wasted opportunity, and of course it won't be the headline at the moment because everyone's uh, obsessed with what Labour are doing and going to do, and it, it's got the nation's hackles up. <laughs> in the past couple of how many weeks five seven weeks they've managed to get the nation's apples up uh rather successfully so um let's see what happens there uh, local elections though definitely stand very good for you uh the pain is good for you. <laughs> uh it's uh, uh and you definitely take something away from it it's different from going to the youth parliament and standing up and screeching away in a high baritone <clears throat> it's it's far more rewarding so young people should definitely stand also because you know uh, there are many well it's really encouraging i've got a lot of mutuals because i do take notice and who follows me but i a lot of young counselors who follow me i don't know why i think i'm the court the court jester of the regional counselor <laughs> i had wanted so much more so um, right yeah. Speaking of which, I think this has been this has been wonderful, for, not for you maybe, but for me definitely. It's been um, awful, and if you and if you broadcast it or publish it, I will sue. Oh, fantastic! Brilliant. Well, <laughs> <laughs> when when when, yeah. when will the public be able to watch this one hour twenty minutes of uh, absolute tip top analysis? Well, you never know. Does it come uh, out is it immediate? Uh, anyway. I uh, ask everyone this. I ask everyone this. Okay. Oh God. So, Peter, you've been, you've been put to trial by I don't know Commissar Keir or something like this, uh, Commissar Starmer to death. Happening uh, soon. For your inappropriate tweets. Absolutely. Um, 
What would your last meal be if you were on death row? What would you choose? Boiled beef and carrots. <laughs>